personally, the most recent game I've been playing is, uh, well, this is a game we're going to talk about a little bit later, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I want to kind of do a mini review of Hellblade Sinuous Sacrifice. It's the latest game from Ninja Theory. I mean, everybody that knows about Ninja Theory, we're talking about Heavenly Sword, Devil May Cry, the remake, as well as Enslaved oh, okay. Odyssey to the West. I love that uh, game, except... <laughs> Ninja Theory has been a company that, like, every game that I've seen of theirs, I've been really impressed with. Mm -hmm. But it seems like when you look at the gaming press as a whole, it seems like the opinions on their games are very polarizing. Like, I don't know what it is, but it seems they, like they can't really come to a consensus with their games. I, it kind of bugged me. I remember playing Enslaved and, like, really enjoying it. But then I got mm -hmm. to the end, and when I got to that very unsatisfying conclusion, I mean, it makes sense in the context of the game. If you play through it twice, it makes more sense, because you catch things you might have missed the first time. Once I got to the end, and a very unsatisfying ending happened, I was like, eh. And then it just sort of like, I like the game, but I felt like it just lost so much because of that, that it was like, okay. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Like, this but, was a I good mean, game, but what I recommend it to somebody, because if they get to the ending, they might break the game. That's going to happen to be so aggravated, because it just has some frustrating moments, and it's like, I don't know. Right, because, I mean, they've always had this weird thing where people get really polarized over their games, but whenever I play them, I don't see what the problem is with them, really. You know, like, I mean, they make really solid titles, and Hellblade is undoubtedly their best game yet, I think. I forgot um, they made Heavenly Sword, to be honest with you, and I remember one thing about Heavenly Sword, the production values on that game for its time, its facial animations, everything about it was just mm -hmm. some of the highest you could find, and it was excellent. They actually took the cutscenes and the game and made it into a movie that I oh, yeah. seen on Netflix, and I remember actually seeing somewhere else. I was like, wait, I was like, that's a video game. And that's how high quality that shit is. It's like the soundtrack to Lair. It's like you don't see that very... You don't see or hear that shit very often in a video game. Maybe nowadays you do, but back then it was like, what the fuck? Yeah, exactly, for sure. Uh, so, for anybody that doesn't know about this game, Hellblade, essentially what this game is, at the very core, it's kind of like an adventure-type game. You're playing as Senua. She is a Viking warrior. Uh, that is trying to rescue a loved one from the depths of hell because I guess he apparently uh, lost his life and she's trying to bring him back. But there is a twist to the whole. But there is a twist. What? The moment you said I thought of Dante's Inferno, I don't know why. Dante's Inferno. There's definitely themes of that in this game for sure. Uh, oh, this game God. definitely touches on several layers of that. But, Does it get um, as disgusting as Dante's Inferno, where I had to, I was like live streaming people, me and people were getting so grossed out by some of the visuals, I just stopped because it was just like becoming offensive. Oh, there is some freaky stuff in this game for sure. There's like uh, I don't really want to get into it. It's kind of spoilerish. I want to kind of just talk more about some of the general themes of the game. Okay. So the twist to the whole story is that Senua at least as far as the developers have told us, suffers from mental psychosis. Oh. And this is a really interesting theme because this is not something that video game developers ever really touch on. Not even movies really touch on this kind of subject matter very much. And so a lot of the uh, subject matter that we see in the game, the developers actually try to, I guess, try to do their best to simulate what someone that suffers from this kind of illness would be seeing or hearing uh, or feeling, you know, and even in, in some cases. That's interesting. I mean, I yeah. suffer from... A lot of people actually don't know this. I don't think I've ever really, really discussed this. And it's only been a recent development in the last several years, but I actually suffer from, a, uh, from epilepsy to a degree, and I occasionally have seizures. And... Right before and after those seizures, I see and experience some weird shit that I can't even verbally explain. Mm -hmm. So now I'm really curious to see how this game handles anything, like anything where you start experiencing weird shit you can't explain. Because it's one thing to say, "Oh, it's Silent Hill's weird," but to see like a uh, real, like real, like they're taking real accounts and putting it into a game that makes me even more interested to play now. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, well, like well, with PTSD and fucking Spec Ops: The Line. Right, right. Well, something like uh, Silent Hill, you know, it does have, like, freaky elements, but they're 
they're they're entirely surreal, you mm-hmm. know, at the same time. And this game does use a lot of surrealism. And, well, no, uh, I meant I meant how Silent Hill draws on the psychosis of how the main characters and their like personal demons and stuff, like Pyramid Head and everything in Silent Hill Two, is just they're they're from James and his the fact that he can't have sex with his wife anymore, the fact that he feels guilt. And he has longing and all the elements around. That's why the game's a masterpiece. All everything uh, structured around the game is all based on his base of his psychosis and his mental slow but steady mental breakdown. Okay, you're talking about the original Silent Hill, right? I'm talking about the uh, the second one, which I didn't appreciate till I got older. <laughs> oh, Silent Hill two. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if. Uh, yeah. When you said James, I was trying to piece James uh, Sunderland. I think was his name. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was the protagonist in two. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's a theme that is not often explored in games or any kind of media, for that matter. Uh, but I think this game did a really good job of it. And the uh, team at Ninja Theory, they actually teamed up with uh, various mental health experts to kind of, like, be analysts for the game, essentially. Like, they were advisors that helped contribute to the project and you know, kind of help them shape and influence the way the game would handle those themes. That's only been done. I've only heard of that being done one other time, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they <laughs> even had uh, people that apparently uh, suffer from mental illnesses also help with okay, the production of the game, because they, like, actually, like, kind of sat in a panel and they would, like, check the themes out of the game at various times. They actually did have a documentary that comes with the game, that you can watch that explains about all that stuff. Although, obviously, for spoiler reasons, you don't want to really watch that until you beat the obviously, game. Obviously, yeah. Because it, it, it'll have all kinds of stuff throughout I, the game that you're watching. You told me about it. I watched uh, one or two trailers. I remember the game being in production. I did not know it was going to be released digitally and only for, like, I think, $30. For the price, what I saw visually in the trailers and one other gameplay video I watched like 15 minutes of the actual gameplay I was like this looks rock solid like this looks like it's a buy almost immediately like even if mm-hmm. these, well, even if uh, there was an issue that I'm sure we're going to get into um, it just looks really really good it looks like something I'm definitely right. going to play sure. and I like Ninja Theory's game so that also counts for sure I mean graphically it's not the best looking game I mean it's really a rock solid title overall but it does have like a few areas here and there where the textures are like, eh, that looks like something off the PS3. Like, they could have definitely did better with something like that. I have listened, but, I played Aliens Colonial Marines. <laughs> Nothing could be more, you can't, you can't get more low-res textures than that on the next-gen console. Unless you're playing Minecraft, but... <laughs> you know what? But Minecraft, as visually lacking as it might be, is a really fun game, so it's the gameplay over the graphics again. Exactly, yeah. I gotcha. Um... But the thing that's really impressive about this game is the sound design. Um, between the uh, minimalist score that it has, but it's whenever you get into like combat situations and such, it really amps up. And it has just kind of like a really creepy f- soundtrack in- as a whole. Like it's definitely survival horror kind of music. Good. And, minimalist um, soundtrack way to go with that sort of theme that you just, that you described. Like, I would not have a booming, bombastic soundtrack like God mm-hmm. of War, for example. I would not oh, put yeah. that. I know she's supposed to be of the Viking lineage, but I would not put something like in that if there's a lot of, like, internal struggle going on. I would keep it more minimalistic and only ramp mm-hmm. it up the time calls for it. It makes it more impactful, too, to have a great score that's very minimal, but then there's those moments because they'll stand out so much more and people remember that moment versus if this whole soundtrack... I'm not saying amazing soundtracks are bad, I'm just saying if you have a minimal soundtrack with a couple of really key notated songs that are like really stand out and are great, to me that's the sign of amazing sound... like amazing sound design, amazing choices made with sound, like placement yeah. and audio choreography. Right, and then also the voice acting is top-notch, like... I fucking it really do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the voice acting is just top-notch, and they do it without using any, like, huge voice actors that they overpay for, like, Troy Baker or someone like that. (laughs) So, as a matter of fact, um, the character that Senua is based on is actually somebody that works with Ninja Theory. They just use one of their own employees to basically model and portray after the character. And she does probably one of the best motion capture performances I've seen. 
I've seen, like I said, I saw a bit of it. I saw the like the movement of the character and stuff. It looked great. I still can't believe yeah. that's quote unquote a budget title. It did not look like a budget title. Right. Well, the whole reason for them making it a budget title is because they're self publishing the game for one. Like I think Ninja Theory kind of got blackballed by the industry after oh. the whole uh, DMC thing because even though it wasn't at all their fault. Like, the fans are, like, really upset about how they made DMC, and Capcom just pretty much signed off on it and was like, yeah, just do whatever you want, pretty much. Can I just, and they kind of, like... Can I just say something about that? Look, I know sure. it's not Dante. I know he's not eating pizza. I know it's not the same It's not the same Dante we know. I know they even make a poke fun at it at one or two points. But at the same time, if you actually played DMC, Devil May Cry, which is... I don't know why they call it that. But if you actually played that game, it's... A really fun game. Yeah, the characters are kind of annoying and obnoxious, but I'm playing that game to beat the shit out of everything, not for engrossing storyline. Which it has a mm-hmm. little bit of story there you may not see coming, but a lot of it is kind of predictable and stupid, as has been pointed out by a lot of reviewers at this point. But it's not a bad game. It's oh, yeah, not worth not at all. slamming it got by a lot of people, and a lot of people were just pissed because it's not the Dante they knew. But have people forgotten how bad Devil May Cry Two was? Exactly, you know, it's like... And what about Devil May Cry, Cry 4? You don't even play as fucking Dante in that. He plays this wholly different character. Not a bad game, but it had some really annoying-ass segments in it. I remember there was one platform segment that almost made me quit the damn game entirely. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's like when people didn't get upset about... Uh, like It'd be like if people didn't get upset about Metal Gear Solid 2, which it's a total, uh, like, oh, striptease. Geez. Like, oh, you Snake in a New Adventure... And don't. then, like, oh, I'm playing as this other guy for the entire freaking game, and he's a whiny cunt. Here's the thing, that's not why... Okay, he, that, was one of the, that was one of the reasons I didn't like that game that much back way when. My other reason was, the storyline was so batshit crazy at the time when I was playing it, and I was expecting more of what I knew from Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation, that I was like, what the fuck is going on? What are they talking about? What is this madness? Later, you know, as I got older, I got used to Kojima's madness and started working it in. But if I go from Metal Gear 1 to 2 to 3... I'd rather just jump from 1 to 3 and skip 2. No offense, Kojima, I just don't like Motor Solid 2 that much. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody, every great has their occasional missteps. I mean, uh, clearly, clearly, uh, he's inspired by Stanley Kubrick. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. But Stanley Kubrick hasn't had all gems. No, he has not. And honestly, when it comes to Metal Gear, uh, fucking Metal Gear Solid 5 is technically, it's so, it's phenomenal, but in terms of gameplay, ugh. Oh, I love the gameplay of Five. I can't. I'm, maybe it's just me. I'm just sick of open world games in general. Yeah, for sure. But um, anybody that's even remotely interested in Hellblade, I definitely recommend it. Uh, I didn't even touch on the combat, but the combat is rock solid. It's very simple. It only uses five buttons. You don't have complex combos or anything like that to worry about. Hmm. But you can pull off some really intricate freaking fighting on in that game, like it's some of the best like choreographed fighting I've seen in a game too. Um, it does get a little button mashy sometimes, and the enemies can be yes. a little bit predictable. Yes. But when, you know, at the beginning of the game, the combat's pretty easy. But you get near the end, you can be like surrounded by like five enemies trying to peck at you, and yes. it I mean, gets fucking, pretty intense. Fucking near Automata has. Like shit like that where it becomes almost button mashy. There's so much crap going on on screen, and it never once screws with the enjoyment of that game. And based on you recommending yeah. this, I definitely pick this up at some point, and I think other people should too. It's Ninja Theory. It looks great. DP's vouching for it, so I'll vouch for it because he's vouching for it because he has great taste in games. So yeah, usually, <laughs> and it's and usually again, good taste in games. It's it, well, we all have our hits or miss. I like fucking looking at me alone in the dark. Looking back on that, was that really you know no. It was me being more pissed off at reviewers than anything else, but not the worst yeah. thing I've played. But, yeah, no, here. yeah, Hellblade. I would, I would recommend it, especially since Ninja Theory made it. I love their games, even if their games are flawed. Their games are usually very memorable. Heavenly mm-hmm. Sword is definitely one of my favorite games they've made. I will say that much. So if they made it, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, definitely check it out. It's kind of funny. I said that was a mini review. I think that's probably been about half the podcast so far. <laughs> <laughs> But it's worth talking about, because you're so yeah. pat- you have a lot of passion towards it, so it's worth going over why it's worth checking out. Sometimes it's just it's worth to regurgitate the same thing a couple times, because people might miss the fact that, no, this is really good, you should try this out. I do so, that in the darkness like a few times, and then people finally play like, wow, that was really good. I'm like, I know! 